Today we are going to read Sailing Home, a story of a childhood at sea. I will read the story aloud and you follow along in your reading textbook as I read. I will stop to ask you questions as I read. After I ask the question, please pause the video so you can think of the answer and then turn it back on and I will tell you the answer. I will also point out vocabulary words as we read. So Sailing Home, a story of a childhood at sea told by Gloria Rand, illustrated by Ted Rand. And the genre is historical fiction. Historical fiction is based on real events in history, but it is a story to which the author has added details from his or her imagination. As you read the story about a family's life at sea, think about which details are historical and which are from the author's imagination. And the question is, could a ship be a good place to call home? Before I start to read, think about this question. Why do you think the author wrote this story about living at sea? And pause your video and think for a minute. The author probably wrote this story to tell us what it was like to spend a childhood on a ship or to entertain us with stories about life at sea. Ours was a wonderful childhood, a childhood spent at sea. My sister, Dagmar, my brother Albert and I, Matilda, grew up aboard the John Ena, a four-mastered sailing bark that carried cargo all over the world. Who is telling this story? Matilda is telling the story because it says I, Matilda. And here we have a vocabulary word, cargo. Cargo means a load of goods carried by a ship, plane, or truck. So we'll pick up right here. Our father was the ship's captain. The ship was our home. Only when the cargo was coal, which is highly flammable, did we have to live ashore. The John Ena had bedrooms, a bathroom, and a main saloon that was a combination living room with a pink marble fireplace and a dining room with a big round table. There was a kitchen called the galley and a storage room full of everything we needed. Unlike most homes, Hours didn't stay put. At night, the ship kept moving, so every morning we woke up far away from where we'd gone to sleep. It often seemed as if we'd lived on a farm, not a ship. Roosters crowed, hens clucked, and ducks quacked. Mother raised them all in neat pens below deck, so we'd have fresh meat and eggs to add to the ship's food supply. Dagmar and I collected the eggs. We all took turns caring for our pets as we traveled around the world. There was Minnie the cat and a dog named Murphy. We had a mongoose, a monkey, a pig, and even a kangaroo. The day the kangaroo accidentally jumped overboard, we screamed for help. The crew quickly lowered a lifeboat and rescued it. Our pet pig wasn't so lucky. She fell into a pot of hot tar the men were using to repair the ship's deck. Piggy died. We had a real funeral for her and a dignified burial at sea. Here we have another vocabulary, vocabulary word, dignified. Dignified means having dignity, noble, stately. And I'll pick up right here. Instead of a backyard or a playground, we had a great wooden deck where we played tag, hide and seek, and catch, always with bean bags because balls bounced overboard. We swung our rope swings, and after our baby sister Ina was born, we took turns wheeling her around the deck in a baby buggy. Now stop now and think about how life on the ship was like and unlike life on land. Pause the video. Life on the ship was like life on land because the ship has bedrooms, a living room, and a kitchen. There are farm animals and pets. It is unlike life on land because their home was always moving. They play on the ship's deck, not in a playground or a backyard. And we can see the word right here, unlike, which points out a difference. And here's another word that points out of a difference, instead of a backyard. When the winds were blowing hard and the sea was full of big waves, we played inside. Our favorite game was sliding across the main saloon floor in cardboard boxes, crashing into one another as the ship rolled from side to side. Time to calm down, 
Mother would say softly when we got rowdy, let's read for a while. Mother taught us how to read and count. She was a good teacher. Father was a good teacher too. Name that planet, he'd say, pointing to a bright steady light in the dark night sky. Before long, we could tell planets from stars and even understood about celestial navigation. As a special treat, Father gave us our own set of signaling flags and we learned to send messages. From the stern of the ship, we sent messages to Father at the bow and he signaled messages back to us. We have several vocabulary words here. We have celestial, which means of the sky or outer space. And we have navigation, which means skill or process of finding a ship's aircraft position and course. And stern, right here, which is the rear part of a ship or boat. And bow, which is the forward part of a ship, boat, or aircraft. There were no radios then, and we were, we were out at sea. Whoops, we have a cat who wants to read. There were no radios then, and we were, when we were out at sea, we seldom saw another ship. If a ship did pass close enough for us to see each other clearly, Father or one of the crew exchanged greetings and information using signaling flags. Real school began when Miss Shipman, a governess, came aboard as our teacher. Albert didn't like her at all. Dagmar said she looked mean, but I thought she was nice. With Miss Shipman in charge, we went to school at the dining table six days a week, mornings and afternoons, with only an hour off for lunch and no recesses. Miss Shipman was good at teaching us history, science, mathematics, and languages, but teaching us geography was impossible for her. We'd seen so much of the world, we knew more than she did. We'd tell her about family picnics in Japan and all about palaces and cathedrals we had visited in Europe. Miss Shipman was impressed, but not with Albert. Albert didn't like school. He played hooky a lot. He'd sneak off to mend sails with the ship's carpenter or help the crew scrub down the deck with flat stones called holy stones. Sometimes Albert crawled up and hid in a little cubby hole by the masthead. Miss Shipman would tattle to father, and father would bring Albert back to school. I like to get away, too, and be alone up in the rigging high above the deck. I like to feel the wind, smell the salty air, and watch the rolling ocean as far as I could see. But I never got to stay up there for long. As soon as one of the crew spotted me, I'd hear a loud shout, Get down, Matilda, you little spider. The crew watched us all the time to make sure we didn't get into serious trouble. They watched us even when they were working, scrubbing sails, laying them out to dry, polishing brass cleats and handles, and mending ropes. Do you think a ship is a good place for children to live? Why or why not? Pause the video and think for a minute. It sounds like fun, but it may be too dangerous for children. Let's continue on 527. The carpenter made toys for us. The sailmaker taught us how to tie nautical knots and the cook baked us special treats. We had the whole crew for friends. Even though our life was different from other children's, we didn't miss out on anything. We had marshmallow roasts at the fireplace, taffy pulls in the galley, and foot races out on deck. Mother always brought along Christmas and birthday presents and decorations for every holiday. Do you think a ship is a, do you think the narrator enjoyed her life at sea? How can you tell? Stop and think. Yes, she says she likes to climb the rig, rigging. She says all the crew members are her friends. She says she didn't miss out on anything that other children enjoyed. Let's continue right here. Only once when I was 10, we almost didn't have Christmas. That year, as we crossed the China Sea, the weather turned wild. We had just started to put up red and green garlands and ropes of sparkling tinsel when Father rushed in. Here, grab this end and tie up that chair, Father ordered as he unwound a big coil of heavy line. We all knew what to do. Like experts, we tied the piano and all the furniture to the railing that ran along the walls of the main saloon and the big hooks the carpenter was screwing into the floor. Mother put little things, lamps, knickknacks, 
and our candy dish into a heavy sea chest. Everything had to be tied up or put away. Otherwise, when the ship pitched and rolled, there would have been stuff crashing and flying all over the place. It wasn't long before we were in the middle of a terrible storm that stayed with us for days. The sky was black, there were huge bolts of lightning, and thunder roared so loud you could hardly think. How long does the storm last? It lasts for days. It tells us right here, the storm stayed with us for days. Let's continue here. No matter how bad the storm became, Miss Shipman made us go to school. The seas got so rough it wasn't safe to sit at the dining table, so we all sat on the floor while Miss Shipman conducted class. And conducted is one of your vocabulary words. Conducted means directed or managed, just like I am conducting class from my house right now. Let's continue right here. We slid back and forth across the floor as the ship rode the waves. It was like riding a roller coaster. After school, we pressed our faces against the portholes and cheered as tons of water smashed against the glass. When Mother saw what we were doing, she pulled us back. I don't want you to get hurt, she said. Those waves could shatter the glass. So the author includes many details about what happened during the storm. Why do you think she does this? Pause and think. She includes so many details because the details help the reader understand what it's like to experience a storm at sea. It makes the storm seem scarier. We'll continue right here. Two of the crew did get hurt when a gigantic wave swept them down the length of the ship. Father dashed out and pulled them to safety. Mother sewed up their bad cuts with ordinary needle and thread. One of the sailors cried. The storm got worse and worse. Lifeboats were torn loose and smashed into pieces by gigantic waves, and the sails were ripped to shreds by screaming winds. But lucky for us, we didn't get seasick. We never did. Father decided the safest place for all of us to be was on the floor of the ship's chart room. That's when we began to get scared. Father tried to get us to think about something else, like having a Christmas party. When we get through this storm, he promised, we're going to have a grand holiday celebration. It will be the most wonderful party we've ever had. Let's start planning it now. At that moment, the ship rolled onto her side and we didn't roll back. We all clung together. Mary, he said as he kissed our mother, the ship has broached and I think we're about to sink. Yes, dear, said mother, looking father right in the eye and smiling the bravest smile you'd ever hope to see. Why do you think the author had mother and father act so bravely when they think the ship is sinking? They acted so bravely because they didn't want to scare the children. So let's continue right here. Neither of them showed any panic or fear and that made us children feel brave too. Father kissed each of us and told us we were great sailors. It seemed our family stayed hugging together forever then the John Ina quivered, a strange quiver, and slowly righted herself. Gradually, the storm ended, and the sea became calm. Time to get our celebration ready, said Father. He had never sounded so happy. With all of us helping, everything was soon put back where it belonged. Girls, hang all this ribbon and tinsel up everywhere. And Albert, you're in charge of decorating the wooden Christmas tree, the one the carpenter made for us. Mother was excited. Don't look, I'm about to bring out the presents. Your father has a surprise for you too, don't you dear? We all laughed because we knew what father's surprise always was at Christmas. He became Santa. That night we dressed up in our party clothes. The crew sang, My Bonnie Lies Over the Ocean. They sang the best they had ever sung. The cook filled the table with delicious treats and we played the gramophone and clapped and cheered watching father dance with mother. They were such good dancers. As promised, it was the best Christmas ever. We were safe, right where we loved to be. We were home, home on the sea. How do you think the narrator feels about living on a ship? We can tell right at the end that she likes it. Despite all the dangers, she feels like it is her home.